Hey writers, if all of your rhyming picture book manuscripts are falling into the rut of ABCB quatrains, it might be time to mix it up a little bit and try some other stanza formats. Today I'll be looking at specifically the limerick form. Welcome writers, I'm Renee Latulipe with the Lyrical Language Lab, the place for kidlit writers to learn all you need to know about rhyme meter and lyrical language. In past videos, I've mentioned that a very common format for rhyming picture books is quatrains with a 4-3-4-3 metrical pattern and an ABCB rhyme scheme. There's nothing wrong with that, so please don't freak out if your rhyming manuscripts fall into that format. That's okay. However, I do always encourage my students to branch out a little bit, to experiment with other stanza formats, just to see what might happen and what might come up when you break free of that very common form. What set me off on this topic is that I recently received a peek and critique submission that is written in limerick form, and I was really excited about it. I said, oh, something different, something new. And we kind of want that to happen when we send our manuscripts to agents and editors, right? So it happened to me, so I thought, you know, let's take a look at this picture book manuscript in limerick form and see what it can offer. Oh, and be sure to stay tuned to the end for today's writing prompt. Now, limericks. No doubt somewhere in your travels you have come across a limerick or two that goes something like, there was an old man from Nantucket. Ya da 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 da. And it is true that traditionally limericks do tend to be a bit rude, but they also tend to be humorous and they have an anapestic rhythm that bounces along and is a lot of fun. So put together humorous, bouncy, and I think it's a really good form for picture books. Let's look at the actual form. A traditional limerick consists of five anapestic lines, a rhyme scheme of A, A, B, B, A. Lines one, two, and five have three feet per line, and lines three and four have two feet per line. If you need a refresher on anapestic meter, you can find my tutorial for that right up here. So to see this form in action, let's take a look at this snippet sent in by author Kelly Conroy. These are selections from Kelly's Big Top Limericks, and although these particular selections are in order, I did omit some for the sake of time, so just be aware that this is not a true representation of the complete progression of the limericks. So let's read what we have here. Step right up. Maxine has been worried all year that the train on the sign will appear. When out past the stream comes billowing steam, the circus is actually here. Pomp and circus stance. The ringmaster's terribly proud to lead the parade through the crowd. The cavalcade nears, Maxine shields her ears, calliope whistles are loud. Floyd and Lloyd. The Vanderwall brothers astound. Their tightrope routine is renowned. They love it up there, sky high in the air. <gasps> Turns out they're afraid of the ground. Highfalutin. The star of the flying trapeze is known as obnoxious Louise. When Adelaide falls, Lou snootily calls, My dear, you forgot to say please. Nine lives. Up next is the trainer and lion. But wait. Should the trainer be crying? The strap of his hat is trapped in the cat. Get out, sir. Believe me, I'm trying. All right, so there's a lot of humor in these that I really enjoyed. Um, as you can see, I've already scanned the first couple of limericks, and it is clear that Kelly is absolutely following the limerick, the traditional limerick form. So she has year up here, here, uh, that's A-A-A, and she's got stream and steam, so she's got the A-A-B-B-A -B -B -A rhyme scheme. Um, she has the three feet in lines one, two, and five, and the two feet in the other ones, as you can see here. Maxine has been worried all year that the train on the sign will appear. When out past the stream comes billowing steam, the circus is actually here. So that is consistent all the way through, and I think she does a really nice job because um, this is not easy, okay? I'm going to throw that out there. Um, this is not an easy form to sustain over an, 
over an entire picture book. So I am quite impressed by how Kelly has managed to do that. And she's done it by choosing really great diction, her word choices. There's nothing fillery in here. Nothing jumped out at me that just said filler, trying to get to the rhyme, trying to get to the end of the line. And that is something that's going to be very important if you, well, in any form that you use, but particularly in a more difficult form like, um, like a limerick. I'm going to get to nitpicking a couple of things here uh, in just a minute, but I did want to point out something about the rhythm of the limerick. It's very bouncy, as I mentioned before. We've got a circus coming to town. There's so much to see. There's colors, there's lights, there's clowns, there's all sorts of things. There's animals. Um, and the little girl Maxine is overwhelmed by all of these sights and sounds and the excitement of the circus finally coming to town. So I really feel that the rhythm of this limerick, this very bouncy rhythm, serves this particular story really well. And that's an, always another important consideration, whether your format is serving your story. Maybe your story is served best by these bouncy limericks. Maybe it is served best by an ABCV quatrain. Maybe it's served best by rhyming couplets. Maybe it's served best by triplets. Only you, of course, can decide that. But I do want to stress again that there is a world outside of the ABCV quatrain that would behoove you to explore. Now let's take a look at some of Kelly's stanzas because I did have a couple of comments. Um, the first one was a logistics thing. In the first one, uh, Maxine has been worried all year that the train on the sign will appear. I wondered about that because it sounds like she's worried that the circus will come rather than it won't come. So that is something for Kelly to take a look at. It seems to me it would make more sense if it were Maxine has been worried all year that the train on the sign won't appear, that there's been some false advertising and that circus that's been advertised all year isn't really going to come to town. So a logistic thing that kind of threw me off right away. When out past the stream comes billowing steam, the circus is actually here. So the actually, again, does sort of um, underscore her doubt that it would actually come. But I feel maybe a finally here would work a little bit better. Uh, this is a girl who's been waiting all year. Children are not known for their patience. So the circus is finally here. I think might add to the drama of that moment a little bit more than the actually, like she's a very cynical little girl. Um, so I might, might wanna play up the drama just a tiny bit here. The next stanza we have pomp and circus stance, and I do like Kelly's wordplay here and throughout. Um, I just had one little thing. The ringmaster's terribly proud to lead the parade through the crowd. It's the word terribly. Uh, for me, that is a word that has a darker, more negative connotation to it. And this guy is very proud. I picture him walking with his puffed out chest, leading the parade like that. So I think I would just prefer a word here that better conjures that more positive image. Now, from this point in the manuscript, we see that all of the acts have a series of mishaps. So nothing goes right in the circus at all. And I think that's a really fun premise. Um, for example, we've got the Vanderwall brothers. It's clear that we're going to need the illustrations to support this because they're up there, they love it up there. And our last line, which is our punch line, turns out they're afraid of the ground. So clearly they've fallen into the net or wherever um, and you'll need that illustration to back that up. Same thing, we have Highfalutin, the star of the flying trapeze is known as Obnoxious Louise, and we know that she's falling. And again, illustrations are going to play very heavily into this particular um, picture book. I did have one thing in this stanza. Um, she's known as Obnoxious Louise. When Adelaide falls, Lou snootily calls, good word, snootily. Uh, my dear, you forgot to say please. Now, Louise is a woman. I'm. Adelaide is a woman. Lou, I'm assuming, is a short is short for Louise. Uh, so there's two women on the trapeze. I'm not really clear there because of the shortened name. So I think that's one little tiny area where um, Kelly took a bit of a shortcut, and I think we might need to somehow 
get a different name in there or make it clear that Louise and Lou are the same person because that was a little confusing to me. And uh, one of my favorites is the lion stanza. I think it's really funny. Uh, should, the, should the trainer be crying? The strap of his hat is trapped in the cat. There's just a lot here to play with with illustrations. So I think that is one of the very strong points of this manuscript. Now, I did have a question for Kelly, an overall question that has nothing to do with the limericks, and that was, um, since these all have titles, I wondered if this was a poetry collection or if it's a picture book. I did see the entire manuscript on this one, and there is an arc. There, the, the mishaps continue, and then there's uh, a nice little tied-up ending. However, the titles for every poem are throwing me off. It makes me think that this is a poetry collection, but there's an arc, there's a storyline going through here. So I feel like it's um, neither fish nor fowl quite yet, and I think it needs to be one or the other. Uh, granted, a poem picture book is one long poem that doesn't have a real story with plot and everything, but it does have an overall arc, but this isn't that. This is more of a real rhyming story picture book. So I think my first advice to Kelly would be to go in the direction of a real story picture book, which means ditch the titles. Because as you heard when I read, I had to continually stop the flow to read a title. And we don't need those titles because the illustrations are going to take us from scene to scene to scene throughout the book. I'm not showing the end of the book here, but I would like Kelly to consider this. We have this series of mishaps. We see that Maxine is actually really enjoying herself and laughing along and thinks that having a grand old time, even though everybody's messing up everything. But I think you need to go further in trying to figure out how Maxine is going to figure more into this story. Uh, because I know Kelly also mentioned that she wasn't sure which way this was going to go. And I think if you really work on Maxine's role more and beef it up a little bit and figure out how she's going to be the hero at the end of this story, I think that's going to help you out and to give you a, a, a larger arc and a more complete arc. And that's my two cents for Kelly, other than to stick with the limerick format because I think it's working really well for you. You've got a great handle on it and I think it's helping you a lot to push on the humor that's in this manuscript. So stick with that, keep doing what you're doing, but beef up Maxine's role and I think you'll be in a good spot. So thank you so much, Kelly, for sending this in and letting me nitpick you in public. <laughs> Now you can certainly find the limerick form in published works as well. And one of the best examples I've seen is in the Ninja books by Corey Rosen Schwartz. She has the three ninja pigs, ninja red riding hood, and Hansel and Gretel ninja chicks. Corey uses a slightly modified limerick form in that she does not strictly follow the AABBA -A -B -B -A rhyme scheme. And that's okay too. She found a variation that worked for her and you can do that. Variations make the world go round and her limericks sound great just the same. Uh, let me show you what I mean by the variation that she uses. Here's the opening to Three Ninja Pigs. Once upon a dangerous time, a wolf loved to huff and to puff. He'd go around town and blow houses down till three little pigs cried enough. So as you can see, she is following the metrical pattern of the traditional limerick, meaning it's anapestic and the first two lines and the last line have three feet and the two line, little short lines have two feet. So that's all good and well. But the rhyme scheme here is A, B, C, C, B, meaning that the first line of every limerick has no rhyme. And instead she is rhyming puff and enough, so line two and line five, and then lines three and four. But line one in every limerick is just unrhymed, and that's okay, it works great. Case in point, here's a spread after all the little pigs are taking their various martial arts classes. His brother, pig two, took jujitsu and learned how to block and to punch. When that wolf comes to knock, he'll be in for a shock. Kaya, I will eat him for lunch. Do you miss having a rhyme in the first line? I don't. Uh, the rest of it hangs together so well, it's so solid, because Corey is a master rhymer, uh, that that first line just hanging there doesn't bother me 
in the least, I don't even notice it. And in fact, I think it works beautifully to give the reader a little bit of a break because limerick after limerick after limerick could possibly get a little bit heavy depending on the subject matter and the word choice and all that good stuff. Uh, so Corey, I think, was very smart here in letting that line hang and give some breathing room to the reader. The point is that you can not only explore rhyming verse beyond the tried and true workhorse of the quatrain, but that you can also experiment and make formats your very own. So let's get to the writing prompt. Writing clever standalone limericks is one thing, but writing a whole string of them into a complete story is a whole other ball game. So for your prompt today, I am not letting you off the hook with a single limerick. Nay, nay. Instead, I challenge you to write a series of at least three limericks that incorporates a little story to see if you can sustain that over the course of three limerick forms. You can choose a traditional limerick format, you can choose Corey's modified limerick format, or invent your own variation. It's up to you. And if you would like to put your limericks in the comments, I would love to see what you come up with. Thanks again to Kelly for submitting her work. If you'd like to submit yours, you'll find a link to do just that in the description below. And if you found this video helpful or fun, please feel free to share it with your writer friends and consider subscribing by clicking the button and that little bell. We'll see you again soon. Ciao for now.